Here beginneth the 22nd verse in the 33rd chapter of the book of the prophet Ezekiel. <clears throat> now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening, afore he that was escaped came, and had opened my mouth, until he came to me in the morning, and my mouth was opened, and I was no more dumb. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land. But we are many. The land is given us for inheritance. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land? Ye stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, and ye defile every one his neighbor's wife, and shall ye possess the land? Say thou thus unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, As I live, surely they that are in the wastes shall fall by the sword, and him that is in the open field will I give to the beasts to be devoured. And they that be in the forts and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease. And the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. Then shall they know that I am the Lord, when I have laid the land most desolate, because of all their abominations which they have committed. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, Lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Here endeth the first lesson. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God. Oh. 
Here beginneth the sixth chapter of the Holy Gospel of St. John. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat on? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Here ended the second lesson. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared me for the face of Save the stay. 
a very special guest, a guest who is visiting St. Paul's for the very first time, but the foundation of this parish is not far from his heart. The Most Reverend Ray Sutton serves as the presiding bishop of the Reformed Episcopal Church, and he is the ordinary of the Diocese of the Mid-America. He is also dean of the province and ecumenical affairs of the Anglican Church in North America 
of which the Reformed Episcopal Church is a founding member and special jurisdiction. He is a native of Kentucky and a Dallas resident since he was 13 years old. Bishop Sutton received his Bachelor's of Fine Arts from Southern Methodist University and his Master's of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary. From 1976 to 1991, he served as a parish minister. Following this, he pursued doctoral studies in an associated research program at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford, with Coventry University, from which he received his PhD. He became the Dean and Professor of New Testament at the Reformed Episcopal Seminary in Philadelphia and continues as an adjunct professor today. Later, Bishop Sutton functioned as Dean and Professor of Theology at Cranbourne Theological House, where he continues to teach. He's offered four books on theology, his most recent being Signed, Sealed, and Delivered, A Study of Holy Baptism. Bishop Sutton is married to his bride, Susan Jean uh, of Dallas, a fellow graduate of Southern Methodist University, and the Suttons have seven children and many grandchildren. The Suttons live in Dallas, where Bishop Sutton's residential office are the pro-cathedral of the Church of the Holy Communion. And we have Nate here today, who's one of our acolytes, who was last year introduced to a book that Sutton wrote many, many years ago, where the kids at Canterbury School here learned the covenantal structure from a book that you wrote, I believe in the 80s, that you may prosper. And he continues to teach us this morning. Uh, please welcome uh, Bishop Sutton. and it is a great honor to be here in this parish. Uh, it comes to me by good reputation of many years ago through friends of mine, Bishop Truman Davis, uh, Dr. Rush Dooney, whose writings were so seminal in the uh, formation of many of uh, my own understandings of the scripture and the Christian faith. And uh, T. Robert Ingram uh, was a friend and uh, he built this phenomenal Christian school in Houston called St. Thomas. And in 1979, when I was um, a, a young priest, uh, we decided to start a Christian school. And I visited uh, St. Thomas in Houston, spent a number of days with Father Ingram. and came back and we modeled our school, Good Shepherd, uh, in Tyler after, after that remarkable school. So you uh, come to me by great reputation although this is my first time actually uh, to be here. I'd like to turn our attention to the second lesson, the gospel reading tonight. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our reason. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the epiphany of the multiplication of abundant life. The third week in Epiphany season of the church here, in which we find ourselves, introduces us to this profound Epiphany beginning with the Gospel reading from John, the second chapter, on the third Sunday in Epiphany. When a wedding at Cana, where Christ was present, ran out of wine, the Lord turned water into wine in abundance. And Jesus did not provide cheap wine. <laughs> We're told that he brought in abundance the very best wine. Now being a curious scholar, I did some calculating. I did a rough estimate on the value of the amount of wine that Jesus provided. Our Gospel says, uh, for the second chapter of John, that began this Epiphany week, that there were six water pots. Now we know from history and archaeology the period that each water pot contained about 30 gallons. The water was used for Jewish cleansing rituals. Hands had to be washed before, during, and after meals. This was a wedding feast. There were presumably very many guests and many hands in need of washing. There was also a cleansing ritual associated with the two about to be wed. The groom even washed the bride's feet as part of that ceremony. For now, let us focus on the six water pots. 
that would have contained a total of 180 gallons of water. <coughs> Six times 30, it's not a hard to figure. <laughs> Consider what must have been the sheer monetary value of such a miracle. I did a little wine research. I was curious to how much the so-called best wine might have been worth. Now, I can't give you some uh, obvious, uh, absolute correct answer. So there's a little speculation here. I don't think I'm too far off, though. Because he said he turned the water into the very best wine. So I Googled the value of the most expensive wines in a chain of liquor stores called Total Wine. <laughs> I can tell from your response that many of you are familiar with this. <laughs> Total wine list among its most expensive bottles of wine around $3,000 and up. And I can tell from your faces that many of you may be wondering what a 3,000 bottle of wine might taste like. <laughs> well, most of us will never know, will we? <laughs> we can imagine, but don't do that right now during the sermon. It's hard to know the value of Jesus Christ's best wine. Maybe it would have been worth 3,000 or upwards, you know, of Twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars, as some of them are listed. I decided to be a bit more conservative. The average cost of the best wines, the total wine stores, is around five hundred dollars. So I figure, modestly speaking, that Jesus' best wine would have been worth at least something around that value. So I did some further calculation. There are approximately there are five bottles of wine in a gallon. Jesus turned one hundred eighty gallons of water into wine. That comes to 900 bottles of wine. Now if you multiply $500 by 900, the amount comes to $450,000. Not a bad wedding gift. <laughs> Perhaps we can imagine, begin to realize the magnitude of this extraordinary miracle. The meaning of Christ's miracle, the multiplication of abundant life through the epiphany of water and wine, is found in Old Testament prophecies about new wine. The Old Testament foretold that the coming of the Messiah would be revealed by the appearance of new wine. In places like Isaiah 35 and Jeremiah 31, we're told that the Messiah would inaugurate a new covenant with new wine. Stands to reason covenants were typically sealed with a meal. Wine was the drink. But if we think forward to the Last Supper of Jesus, He revealed His greatest miracle, taking a cup outside of His own death on the cross. He took a cup and He said, This wine is My blood. And then He added, This is the new covenant in My blood for the forgiveness of sins. This was the point of the new wine prophecies of the Old Testament. The Messiah would make new wine that would seal a new covenant through Him and through His blood. Turning water into wine emphatically revealed that Jesus was and is this new wine Messiah. Messiah had come. And this brings us to the second great epiphany of the multiplication of abundance from John's incredible gospel. It's in our New Testament lesson for this evening. In the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, we read of the feeding of the multitudes at which Jesus Christ once again multiplies in abundance. You remember the story. The multitudes followed Jesus out into the wilderness. They reached a point where they too were too far out to turn back they were also too tired and hungry to press on. They needed food and lots of it. The disciples failed the test when asked what they thought the solution was. The young boy steps forward, offers his last five loaves and two fishes. Jesus performed one of the greatest of his miracles. He took those loaves and fishes and turned a little into a lot, so much that there was an abundance of leftovers. The epiphany of multiplication and abundance. At the wedding, Christ provided the wine. In the feeding of the multitudes, 
He multiplies the bread. Bread and wine. Could it be any more obvious where Christ was going? The feeding of the multitudes fulfills a great Old Testament prophecy. What many of us probably do not know is the background of this story. I learned it from one of my lecturers at Oxford who became Bishop of Durham, N.T. Wright. He has written about it in his book, Jesus and the Victory of God. He explained one day in class that the Jews of Jesus' day expected that the real Messiah would conduct a great banquet feast when he, come, when he came in history. Isaiah the prophet had foretold this in the 25th chapter of his great book. It is one of the new wine prophecies of the Old Testament. It reads, And the Lord of hosts, the Messiah, will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. A banquet of aged wine. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples. Even the veil which is stretched over all nations, he will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Based on this passage and many others throughout Scripture, Bishop Wright went on to develop how it was believed that the Messiah would accompany his coming with a great feast of some sort. New food, bread, and wine would be provided in abundance. But our passage from John 6 explains the meaning of the new food of the Messiah. Jesus takes the discussion to flesh and blood. Another very important event takes place when the Messiah establishes his banquet. Holy Scripture in the Old Testament also reveals that when Messiah comes, he destroys this great serpent fish named Leviathan, as described in Job 41. And for this reason, it was believed that when the Messiah comes, he would slay this Leviathan and as a symbol of the destruction of this great fish, Second Temple Judaism believed that fish would be a heavenly food eaten in heaven. The Messiah's heavenly food is revealed as provided in the feeding of the multitudes. We can appreciate why Christ multiplied fish with bread at this great feeding. We see that the 5,000 that day in John 6 understood this as the great messianic banquet promised by the prophets. The Messiah had come. He was going to destroy the serpent represented by the fish by feeding that serpent. He provided new food symbolized by loaves and fishes. Later in the passage, Jesus calls the bread His flesh. In case we miss the point, He says... He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 54. They, they didn't fully understand what he meant. The church has never really fully understood exactly what that means. But they did receive some necessary clarification at the Last Supper on the night he was betrayed when he took bread and wine. He said, this is my body. And he lifted up the chalice and declared, this is my blood. Bishop Lancelot Andrews, a great 16th century Anglican theologian and bishop, once said in a sermon, Jesus didn't say, this is my body and my blood in this way. That is, Jesus didn't tell us how the bread and wine become the body and blood. The Western church had fallen into grievous error the time of the 16th century with a doctrine called transubstantiation. The 39 articles of our church uh, call that doctrine unacceptable. Nevertheless, the same articles say that the body of Christ in the 28th article is given, taken, and eaten in the supper of the Lord in an heavenly and spiritual manner. So Christ is really present in some albeit mysterious way. Perhaps the best biblical definition of a sacrament is there for the word "mysterion," the Greek word for mystery. So the Anglican minister says to the one about to receive the Holy Communion, the body, blood of Christ, which is given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. In this the words of John 6 are fulfilled. He who eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life. 
great clarification of the English Reformation is added to provide the explanation that to whom and for whom the blessed sacrament of Christ's body and blood become eternal life. Another sentence was added at the time of the English Reformation to the one that I just quoted. This part was added. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. The body and blood are given, but they do not become effectual unto salvation unless we receive by faith in Jesus Christ. This too fulfills the language that we find in the 6th chapter of John. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, he who believes on me has eternal life. Then he adds, I am the bread of life. John 6, 47. Ironically, even though the Lord had provided with pristine clarity the meeting of the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples were thick-headed, some of them were thick-headed, slow to realize what the opportunity of feeding the masses meant. He had declared to them, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my body. Yet they still didn't get it. And after 2,000 years, many others still did not get it. The good news for us tonight is that the wedding feast of the marriage supper of the Lamb has already begun. It started on the night of the Last Supper. Jesus Christ's epiphany was that He is the new wine, the new groom God made man in the flesh. He married his new bride when he shed his blood on the cross for her, the church. In his holy supper, the blessed sacrament of body and blood, he began the wedding feast. He offers the ultimate new wine in his cup of salvation. What he provides is the best wine. For that wine is his body and blood. And part of the epiphany of the Old Testament new wine prophecies is that Christ provides in abundance His body and blood. Since that first last supper, Jesus Christ has been coming to His people in abundance to give them His life all over the world, down to the ages. And the wine in the Eucharist is the very best wine. <laughs> Amen. Because it's Him. So we may not be able to afford $500 bottles of wine. Maybe we don't drink wine at all. We still get the best wine of all of history in God's blessed sacrament. And we can have every time we come by faith when we receive it. He says to us in the words of another parable about a wedding feast, Come, beloved. All is made ready. In just a moment we'll finish our evening prayer and we'll receive a, a blessing from the bishop, but I want to just take a moment to say a few announcements and recognize a few of our guests this evening. First, following the service, we will have a reception just next door, so please stick around and have a chance to speak with the bishop and our other priests who are here visiting. Uh, you're all invited. Some of you may be wondering where the restrooms are. They are in the hallway out here, so after service, please, as you need. But I also, uh, we, since we are here at a, a Christian school, want to recognize a couple of our staff that are here with us this evening. First, I'd like to recognize Mr. Gary Sawyer, who's Stan Gary. Uh, who teaches third grade here at Canterbury Christian School, and Mrs. Devette Kuyper, who teaches fifth grade here at Canterbury Christian School. And there in the back we have Mrs. Vijay Kumar, who teaches kindergarten here at Canterbury Christian School. And Bishop, as you thought to give your prayer for just a moment, I want you to remember them especially. 
that these are the men and women who have devoted their lives to not only our Lord, but to the next generation in Christian education. They come in here Monday through Friday, and they want to see children formed in the knowledge and the love of God who rise up to continue to share this truth with all generations. So make sure you shake their hand this evening. It's also my pleasure to announce that thanks to Father Foose, who is the headmaster of St. Andrew's Academy up in Chester, uh, Canterbury is now a member of the Anglican Schools Association, uh, which is governed by Bishop Sutton and the REC board. We are very pleased to be a part of that organization as well. So, with that, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, we beseech the Almighty God that the words we have heard this day with our ears may through thy grace be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruit of good living to the honor and praise of thy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.